Good afternoon and welcome to Office Hours at Duke University. Today, we are joined by Wida Basevi. Actually, Wida isn't really with us. She is our guest's avatar. It's who she is in the online virtual world of Second Life. Today, we'll be learning more about avatars, Second Life, virtual worlds, immersive environments, and other fascinating new forms of digital media. And we'll learn how they're being used here at Duke in academics. So let's take this opportunity to meet our guest, our real guest, here in the real world. She is Victoria Sabo, Program Director of Information Science and Information Studies. Acronymically, that would be the ISIS program here at Duke. Professor Zabo will guide us into the world of digital culture, new media, and virtual world technology. She'll also update us on some of Duke's efforts in these fields, including the Visual Studies Initiative at the Smith Warehouse. Before coming to Duke in 2006, Professor Zabo worked at Stanford University as an academic technology specialist and as an instructional multimedia specialist at Grinnell College. And lest you think she dwells only out there on the cutting edge of new media, she's also an adjunct assistant professor of Victorian literature in the Department of English. Professor Sabo earned her doctorate in English at the University of Rochester and her master's degree at Indiana University. If you're joining us for this webcast, we certainly encourage you to send along your questions and comments. You can do so simply, uh, well, one of three ways. You can uh, send us a question by posting a, a comment or question on the Duke University Facebook page. You can tweet us with the tag Duke Live, or you can send us an email to live at duke.edu. Professor Zabo. Thank you so much for joining us today on Office Hours. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. We are living in a time of, uh, as we just heard, Facebook and Twitter, RSS, uh, video games, multiplayer video games are a bigger business than Hollywood movies. You could say we're in a time of a communications revolution. And this all sort of falls generally under the term new media. What's your definition of new media? Well, new media today is really digital media, which has uh, the characteristics of being interactive, multimodal, participatory, um, but it's also produced digitally. But new media is also a term that could be used to describe any new medium that comes into the world and disrupts all that came before. So you mentioned my background in Victorian literature. Um, My argument back when I was working on that stuff was that mass publication, mass publishing industry was itself a form of new media. So new media is really the media where the medium itself is larger than life and and is the first thing people think about rather than the content itself. When we hear the term new media, we also uh, wonder about, you know, what constitutes it, uh, for example, with uh, older, more established old media outlets, for example, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, all of these uh, publications, of course, have, have digital online versions as well. Do we think of, for example, the New York Times website as new media? Well, yes, I'd say that the New York Times website is new media, but it's also participating in an older form, and it takes reference from that older form. So the New York Times, as a newspaper, has a characteristic font set and layout and way of representing information. And then, of course, there's all the reporting that goes behind it. So the new media version of the New York Times has many of the same features that are referential and help you to uh, gain some of the cachet of the original New York Times. But then it also has a lot of elements that are unique to the web or Internet form uh, with the videos and uh, blogs and other activities that are really only done in the new media realm. I think that many new media objects take their start and take some inspiration from older media, and that's the transitional phase that we're in right now. It may be that later people won't even know that there was a paper version of the New York Times. Here at Duke, one of the groups that's working to study new information technologies and to analyze their impact on various parts of our society 
is the group ISIS, Information Science and Information Studies. Um, tell us about ISIS. Well, ISIS is an interdisciplinary certificate program and research center. And we really try to think about technology and new media, both in critical terms and their impact on society, as you mentioned, but then also in producing them and understanding them from within. So students in our courses both learn how to think about what the impact on, say, the internet economy is, but then also how to make web pages and uh, multimedia objects and to really participate actively in this new medium. One of the uh, goals of the ISIS program is collaborative knowledge production. Could you give us uh, an illustration, uh, maybe uh, a recent example of student projects that illustrate this type of uh, collaborative knowledge production? Yeah, collaboration is really essential to everything we do. In the new media landscape, you have to have people working in all kinds of fields. It's not all about the individual producer anymore. So one of the things that we do is have a senior capstone project where students work together to create one thing. What the students did this past spring was create a, a mapping toolkit, is what we called it. It was a way to combine Google Earth uh, layers with uh, multimedia content in order to map the Mahuru Bay region in Kenya. Uh, and what the students did was create a toolkit that could then be taken by our Duke engagers who are working in the Mahuru Bay region with global health researchers and with the people who are developing a boarding school for girls to establish a way to represent that community in all its complexity through these new media forms. Uh, so the students actually played with some of the new technologies, the uh, smartphones and GPS trackers and other devices, and then also learned how to author in Google Earth to create a product that could then be passed along so that other students who are more specialists in the content could actually take that and begin to author in this new type of environment. It does seem that the ISIS program uh, attracts a wide range of students. Uh, by the way, if you are joining us for today's conversation on Office Hours, we invite you to send us a question or comment that we'll be able to use um, on the air. To do that, uh, you can simply email us at live at duke.edu. You can also uh, post your question on the Duke University Facebook page, or you can tweet us with the tag Duke Live. Uh, as we mentioned, the ISIS program here at Duke attracts students who are majoring in a broad range of uh, subject areas, everything from music and philosophy, French, engineering, why do you think there's such a broad appeal for this kind of experience among today's undergraduates? Well, I think that most students realize that new media is something that's going to impact everything that they do, whether they go into uh, medical school or graduate school or law school or go on to work in a variety of fields. We've had many students come back from ISIS and say, later, once they're out in the job market, I didn't realize how much the things that I learned there were going to make a difference when I was out on the job market. So learning how to produce, I think that's the thing that becomes really intriguing to the students. We have a class called Introduction to Web-Based Multimedia Communication that's always oversubscribed. So the students come in wanting to learn how to build websites and how to do digital media and how to create databases and things like that. And then beyond that, the cultural impact of new technology is something that we're all experiencing. Um, so I think that they become interested in that. And then when we get into the group project areas, because each of them can bring something to the table, I think they all feel valued for what they can bring. So as I mentioned earlier, the artists can work on uh, the graphics and design, and people who are budding videographers can do video. People who are interested in code and programming might do some of the, the back end work or some of the interactions. There's really something for everybody in our program. And because of the internet, this would certainly uh, be a perfect example of around the clock, around the world type collaboration. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, uh, we have a class that's being taught this semester and another one will be taught next semester that is happening concurrently here and in uh, East China University of Science and Technology in uh, Shanghai. Uh, the idea there is to have a real-time interaction through video conferencing as well as an asynchronous interaction through email and blog posts and things like that to really take the best of both worlds. One of the most uh, significant trends in the academic world in recent years has been the concept of interdisciplinarity. Um, how does such a program as ISIS help us to uh, cross these 
uh, boundaries of traditional academic subjects and sort of navigate across the various disciplines? Well, I think that one thing that's happening is the disciplines are finding that they have common methods or that they need to articulate their methods um, in a way to communicate with each other when doing multimedia projects. So just as it happens at the undergraduate or graduate student level with things like the, the, the mapping project, um, I think it happens even beyond there when people try to think about creating new databases or uh, new forms of, of expression, um, archives. Uh, but then also, because you can use digital media to sort of scaffold your discipline, you can get people in at a higher level. And I'm thinking most specifically there about tools like scientific visualization or information visualization, where more and more they're becoming ways for people who don't have that background to be able to jump in and do some work within that. Um, it's the GIS example would be one that I'd come to. GIS a few years ago was something that was really only accessible to people who'd spent a lot of time doing that work. But increasingly, the tools are out there to allow people to take a step up and to practice um, and bring to their discipline work that's being done in other fields and to mix and match and combine those ideas. This fall, you launched uh, a new project called the Virtual Crystal Palace Project that seems to um, sort of span uh, different eras. Could you explain what the, uh, the Crystal Palace project is and, and how it works? Yeah, so the Victorian uh, Crystal Palace, uh, it's taking its inspiration from the Great Exhibition of 1851, which was this big glass building in Hyde Park that contained the sort of the first World's Fair. So there were exhibits from all over the world. It was this fascinating event that was all involved in nation building and in uh, self-representation of the empire to itself and, and all kinds of wonderful things that we in Victorian studies love to think about. But uh, what we wanted to do was think about how virtual exhibition practices, how taking art and cultural materials and putting them in a virtual space relates to conventional exhibition practices. So things that might happen in, in a museum or a gallery or just out in the world. Uh, and the idea there was to have the students recreate some aspect of the historical exhibit in the virtual world space and think about how those two things relate to each other, what carries over and what doesn't. I remember back in uh, 2007, I went to a podcasting symposium, which was held here, here at Duke, and you were one of the featured speakers for that event, and you used the term hybrid university. Could you explain what you mean by a hybrid university? Sure. The hybrid university is the university that combines the type of university we have here now at Duke that's residential, that uh, has students coming in from all over, has faculty in real time, in real space, in real buildings, um, but then also has a substantial digital media or new media dimension, one that reaches out beyond the boundaries of our geographic location temporally and spatially. Uh, when I was talking about the hybrid university at the Podcast Academy, I was coming out of my experiences at Stanford University where I helped to develop the iTunes U initiative there. And now many universities have iTunes U and they have lectures and sessions and all kinds of things out there. But it was a real question whether that would be a good idea, whether we wanted to put some of the work that was being done in the classroom out into the world. You know, is this intellectual property that should be uh, kept locally, kept close within the university? Um, but the hybrid university recognizes that we're working out in the field, that we're part of a larger community, and that what happens in the university can benefit people outside, and that contrarily also, people from the outside can come in and, and participate in that. So it's keeping the university as a university, but expanding the boundaries and making them more porous. Um, in a big picture sense, how do you believe that digital media are changing higher education? I think that digital media is changing higher education in lots of ways. Uh, well, one is in pedagogy. Uh, as you mentioned, I've worked in academic technology for a number of years before I came to Duke. And my job there was to think about how technology would transform the way people teach. And that involved producing content and the delivery of content, as well as the types of work that students would do to create new knowledge. Um, and I think that what we're starting to see now is that as that production side becomes more important, as authoring new scholarship becomes more and more sophisticated within its use of new media, we're really starting to be forced to see how that impacts things like the tenure and promotion process or publications and what counts as good work within a field. Uh, also, I think that the fact that we're now archiving things and we can do so many things 
asynchronously means that the traditional course structure might change. It might become less important to have courses that are for a six peri fixed period of time with certain activities and more things could be put into online tutorials, not with the goal of getting rid of the professors or reducing face time, but with changing what actually happens in class versus outside of class and making it more of a mix and match scenario that's available to help the students plan uh, according to their own needs and interests. Thank you. Uh, we're speaking today on Office Hours with Victoria Sabo, who is a uh, new media specialist here at Duke. She is the program director for the ISIS program and also, as we'll learn soon, has her own avatar in the uh, virtual world of Second Life and also teaches Victorian literature. So we have a lot more to talk about. If you are viewing this webcast, we're glad to have you and you are cordially invited to uh, submit a question to Dr. Sabo. To do that, you can simply post a comment on the Duke University Facebook page. You can tweet us with the tag Duke Live or you can send us an email to live at duke.edu. We've been talking a lot about uh, new media and academics. Let's uh, broaden this just slightly. A lot of your recent work has been done in Second Life. Mm -hmm. For those of you who are not familiar with Second Life, it's a kind of a, I, I guess, am I correct? It's a combination virtual world, computer game, and 3D modeling platform. Could you give us a, just a brief overview of what Second Life is uh, and other similar virtual worlds? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, Second Life is, as you mentioned, it's a virtual space, um, and it consists of a lot of islands that are produced by people all over the world. Um, and it's a place where everyone who has an avatar can log in and be participating at the same time in this virtual space. And that's what makes it so distinctive and so interesting that it's not just you creating on your desktop an individual 3D environment like you might do with some of the other software tools that are out there, but you can actually be out there in the virtual world interacting with other people over the content that you create. One of the reasons that we chose it for our virtual Crystal Palace exhibition was the idea that we could actually have an audience coming in from who knows where, looking at what we're doing and commenting on it down the road. Uh, different virtual worlds have different types of uh, people who are associated with them. Second Life has also a tremendous virtual economy, so people will create objects and sell them to each other. There's all sorts of interest groups, uh, people who come together for political and social reasons, finding a community in the virtual realm. And then there's also a lot of, not unsurprisingly, architectural projects and exhibits and things like that that are allowing people to author within that world. When you become a, a resident of Second Life, you typically create what's called an, an avatar of yourself. Uh, I think we just saw a couple of moments ago your avatar, uh, Weed of a Savi. Mm -hmm. And tell us about how the, the process that you used to create Weeda, what, you, what your thoughts were as far as creating her, and what you, uh, how you hoped that she would represent you in this virtual realm. Well, Wida Basevi was my second avatar. My first avatar was an effort to create an avatar that looked as much like me as possible within the limitations of what was available in virtual space. And that is something that a lot of people do. They get in and they use these tools. You spend a lot of time, at least many of my students do, spend a lot of time tweaking things. There's an amazing ability to um, edit each aspect of your appearance so you can decide exactly how skewed your nose is and how, how puffy you look and, and all sorts of things uh, that are different than what you'd see in a normal game space. But when you create an avatar, the first thing you have to do is come up with a name. Um, and this isn't as uh, simple as it seems because you don't have the endless array of choices that you have as a person naming a child. Um, you have to choose uh, from a list of available last names and then pick a meaningful first name that is not used by somebody else. So my name, Wida, comes from a 19th century author, Wida, um, that was her pen name, who was uh, a sensation novelist who participated in all sorts of um, political and social activities, held salons, um, and also fancied herself a mover of world events. Some of it was her fantasy, some of it was real. But it, to me, the idea of an avatar really extended from this uh, 19th century conception of a person who's an author but also a performer and who feels that they're... Um, creating a presence that is going to make a difference in the world. 
And then as far as the way that my avatar looks, I was having a little bit more fun with it. Um, at the time that I created it, I was teaching Frankenstein um, and thinking about uh, women and uh, technology. It was a class on gender and digital culture. And so I was trying to make the avatar look a little bit Frankensteinish, like it had been constructed out of material parts and put together. So it has this goth sort of appearance to it. So uh, t tomorrow night is Halloween. Uh, does this mean that um, that Second Life is going to be even more interesting tomorrow night? And will uh, will Wida be wearing um, a costume? <laughs> um, I think that tomorrow night will be very interesting. People do have a lot of parties and social events in Second Life. You can do things like uh, program dance moves, um, and people will put on different costumes. Um, I haven't tended to go that direction that much myself, and since my character is already somewhat Frankensteinish looking, maybe it doesn't need a costume. But in real life, I don't do much Halloween either. So in that sense, they correspond. Uh, Duke University has uh, what's called the Isis Oasis in Second Life. I assume this is some real estate, a, a, a virtual property exactly. that Duke holds the title to. Uh, tell us about it. Who lives there and, and what goes on there? Well, as I mentioned earlier, Second Life is a community that anybody can come into and wander around in. Um, and you also build things if you have land or you have access to land. Um, and there's all sorts of interesting sociological parallels to make here. But uh, we bought this space so we'd have a kind of safe space for students who wanted to come learn about working in Second Life and who wanted to build projects where we could choose who could and couldn't come into the community. Um, and that also we'd have full control over how we terraformed the land, how we broke it up. So it's an oasis in a very literal sense. It's a place that you can come and be in the Second Life world and not worry about having griefers come in, unless they're your fellow students, of course, or faculty. Um, and you can do work within that and hopefully in a collaborative, mutually supportive way. We've uh, received a couple of uh, questions and comments for today's edition of Office Hours with Professor Victoria Sabo. Uh, we'll be getting to those in just a moment. Let re me uh, re remind you again that we welcome your questions and comments for Professor Sabo. You can uh, simply go to the Duke Facebook page, the Duke University Facebook page. Alternately, you can tweet us with the tag Duke Live, or you can email us at live at duke.edu. Uh, so what do you think about uh, one of the uh, upcoming releases that's that's getting a huge push for this uh, this coming Christmas holiday uh, movie season is the long-awaited new film by director James Cameron called Avatar. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you hear about this film, what it um, what it might mean, and what you think it might do in terms of increasing awareness of the whole uh, realm of virtual worlds. Sure. Well, the Avatar movie is a little bit different than the types of avatars we've been talking about in that the concept is that there's a, a flesh body that's genetically engineered and grown and that a soldier goes into in order to uh, basically take over the natural resources of an alien world. Um, and then he has a love interest and things change. And you can almost imagine where the story goes from there. Um, but it's a little bit different than the types of avatars we're talking about, and actually closer to the original religious conception of an avatar as the enfleshment of a, of a deity uh, in the real world. Uh, but the other thing that's really interesting about the Avatar movie is that it has a game that's coming out at the same time. Instead of the game being an appendage that comes after, the game is itself being released even a little bit early before the movie itself. So that shows you the relationship of, of the Hollywood scene to the game scene and their high expectations for what that game should be like. The other thing that's fun about that movie is that it's going to be done in a stereoscopic 3D, a new form of 3D that uh, Cameron's been working on. So it'll create an immersive sense, which, which is something that we think about a lot when we're thinking about virtual world spaces, uh, but within a movie theater. So there's more and more of a blending of these, these forms um, and a cross-pollination between them. We have a uh, we have a, a a comment from uh, from Twitter for today's office hours from uh, Newman S uh, or Newman Five that is uh, Duke's uh, Duke you may be familiar with this a Duke School of Nursing building has been mm -hmm. created in Second Life for classes uh, were you involved with this uh, yeah I was involved in that that's actually on our adjacent island which is called Duke Metaverse um, which is a space where we have some persistent projects. 
um, that last over a longer period of time that we don't let the students uh, just sort of tear down and edit. Um, so yeah, the Duke School of Nursing decided that they wanted to have a place where people who were um, working uh, in some remote education could get together in a, in a sort of social space. And they are also um, showing slides and doing symposia and things in that space. So that, that's directed by uh, Constance Johnson in the Duke School of Nursing. And they spent a lot of time and effort to create a really gorgeous building that has things in it like a slideshow viewer. And uh, they have people come together periodically to uh, meet and to uh, have an extra dimension to their online interactions. So let me ask you this. Wh where do you think all this is going? I mean, is this, are we seeing basically a, a so, sort of a primitive first step uh, when we look at, at Second Life and other similar virtual worlds, do you think of this as sort of a, a first step towards someday being able to have a simulated reality technology, uh, kind of like the, uh, the uh, fictional Star Trek uh, holodeck? Everybody loves the holodeck, yeah. I think that there, we are going in that direction, and it's coming from a lot of different areas. Uh, the holodeck idea is being uh, realized a little bit with this Project Natal that's coming out of Microsoft. It's a, an interface for working with a, with a game that allows you to move around without having to have tennis balls or even a joystick or anything else attached to you. Um, it's a, so you can use real life movements and have those movements be translated into the virtual world space. So that's one way that that's happening. But that's not really immersive in the sense that you're still looking at a screen. Um, there's other things like what we have already here on campus. Uh, the dive facility that Rachel Brady runs is another form of immersion and holodeck type quality. And that's more of your glasses and headset, but it's something that you're interacting in a space that's literally immersive. There's a projection on each side, so you walk into a box and you're there. Um, over at UNC, they have a dome, which is like the dome that you would see in a planetarium, um, but it gives you a wide field of view, so you can get into that space and see it from there and uh, speak and see things from the certain point of view, a unitary point of view, and to see out in the world. Um, so we're getting there with a lot of different technologies. Some of them do more than others. It's, uh, if you patch them all together, I think you can get close to a holodeck experience. But right now the question is, could you give it to the masses? And the answer is no. You have to have a very structured environment that one person can step into. But that's what I think is starting to change now. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the debate surrounding digital media. Uh, let's first encourage, uh, if you have any questions, we'll be going for a few minutes more here on our office hours today. If you have questions for Professor Sabo, uh, you can send them to us at the Duke University Facebook page. You can also uh, uh, tweet us at Duke Live, or you can email us at live at duke.edu. Um, as with any period of profound change, any revolutionary time, there's certainly plenty of debate surrounding digital media. Let's take a, a brief uh, look at some of these areas of debate, even controversy. First, uh, could you discuss some of the issues surrounding digital copyright? Well, that's a big one. So some of the issues around digital copyright are related to the copying of materials that were not necessarily born digital or weren't born digital in the same form that they're being distributed. Um, so then we have a question of if you have, uh, this is the MP3 file issue, if you have an MP3 file of a song, one of the arguments that the users who would distribute that song freely might make is that it's, they're not losing anything, it's a copy. And this is uh, one of the fundamental aspects of digital media that makes it different from old media um, because it is copyable. Um, and by copying it, the one argument you can make is, well, yeah, it's this. it should be free. Information should be free. We're putting the artificial constraints of old media on our new media, and instead we should think of other distribution mechanisms. The counter-argument, of course, is that, well, real people produce that work and put their labor into it and should be getting some of the yield that comes out of that. Um, and it's a fine thing to say that, um, that information should be free, but the production of quality content is not free. Um, and then when we get into things that are born digital, there's sometimes a question of uh, how do you maintain it? How do you distribute it? How do you do digital rights management? Uh, the Kindle is an interesting example here. You're distributing texts, and you can buy them on the Amazon website. But right now, you can't really do anything with that text except for use it on your own personal Kindle. You can't share it with other people like you could a conventional book. 
Um, some people are cracking that code and sharing those files, again, with this information is free concept. But what does that mean? And how does that affect uh, the future of the publishing industry? Uh, there might be new m ways and new models to do distribution so that you can have cost revenues continuing, uh, or revenues to continuing to come in to pay off some of the costs. But we really have to think about new models. One of the, one of the uh, issues that's been with us for a while, particularly in the area of role-playing games, is the question of gender. Um, mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about some of the gender issues that are associated with virtual worlds and other online spaces, as well as in uh, RPGs? Yeah, the gender question is actually pretty complicated. Um, the, the most obvious thing to look at is to see the, the buxom babes um, who are in the top 10 video games lists and things like that, and to understand that those are the typical stereotypes that you might expect. But the issues actually are a little, go a little bit deeper than that, and that it's more about who's using them and who's getting access to these technologies. Uh, especially true in the game space that uh, the types of things that you often do in the games that are successful are things that are um, historically associated with boys. And there's been education research done, um, having direct conflict and having a lot of fast-paced action. Um, so one of the things that's happening is that the market is starting to address that in its interests in, peeling a, uh, in appealing to a wider range of users by finding other modalities of gameplay that are more appealing to a wider range of, of people, like having something that's maybe co more cooperative or having things that are, uh, the conflict is not directly with another opponent but against a third party, things that are usually girls uh, and women seem to be find more comfortable working with. And the reason that's important is that we don't want to create a culture where only the boys become digitally literate through games and through other types of online interactions because they're the ones who are drawn to it. I think that it's a big educational challenge. How do we ensure that all of our students are, who are coming in and going out of Duke are actually conversant with all these media in a critically engaged way, in a thoughtful way? And it's not just about games. It's about being able to use all types of content, but the games can be one of the gateways into that. And there are, we should say, there are, uh, there is the regular version of Second Life. I think there isn't there also a Second Life teen version? Yeah, that's right. Uh, there, well, there's, it's the same Second Life, but there's only certain areas that you can go into. Um, so you can choose to rate the land that you're on to be um, PG or not. And if it's PG, then it's limited to only certain, to people, I mean, it's open to everybody, um, whereas other places might be adult only. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about the psychological effects of living in a virtual world? Um, are there risks? Is it possible that a resident of a virtual world someday could uh, have problems kind of distinguishing uh, reality from this alternate parallel uh, reality? I can say yes, because historically there have always been people who've gotten involved in an imaginative space and become obsessed with it. But much more than that, there's been paranoia and anxiety about that possibility. Uh, it, going back to the 19th century, a lot of people worried about women reading novels because they thought that their systems were too sensitive and were overly excited by the reading of novels. So if you put it, or the working classes for that matter, so if you put it into that larger framework, you say, yes, there, there are some possibilities and there's some cases. Um, Edward Castronova has pointed out that especially in uh, Korea there and uh, in some of the other East Asian cultures where gaming is even bigger than it is in the United States, there are these cases of students or kids who become completely obsessed and never leave their rooms. And of course, this happens here too. Um, but you have to wonder if that isn't part of a larger social issue and not specific to game so much, but that their game addiction is an expression of something that's going on anyway. Another uh, question we have, which has come to us uh, via Twitter, and uh, we remind you again, you can, uh, you can send a question to Office Hours at the Duke University Facebook page. Uh, you can tweet us at Duke Live, or you can uh, email, send us an email at live at duke.edu. This is a question that takes us back to uh, academics, and it is a question um, from Twitter that asks, how can professors go about integrating this technology, uh, Second Life, and so on? How, how can a professor go about uh, integrating this into... Um, his or her uh, courses, and are there some, uh, I know there are resources, but are there also pitfalls to avoid? 
Yeah. Um, so one answer is the Center for Instructional Technology here at Duke uh, supports people getting going in these areas. And um, I can give you a little plot of land to work on in Second Life, if you like, uh, on the Duke Isis Oasis. So there's that immediate question. But then the larger question is uh, you need to think about what you're going to do with it um, and how much time you want to spend in the virtual world space. If you want to just explore Second Life as um, as a new cultural phenomenon, a new media phenomenon, you can do that for free without having to go in and pay money to build things or to learn how to build things. There's this whole level of interaction that can happen just by going around in the world and looking at things. And a lot of people are starting to do that as a phenomenon. Um, if you get more involved in the, the construction side, and this is true with any class that has a production component, you have to think about how much time do you really want to spend on teaching people how to make content? Now in ISIS, because one of our goals is to encourage people to learn how to make content, this isn't as much of an issue. But even in ISIS, when classes are more topically based, a seminar where you have students doing media projects, you really want to ask, do you want to spend your time teaching people how to do simple video? Or do you want to spend your time talking about the books or essays that you've been reading? Um, it's not always that binary, but there is that danger of going down the rabbit hole. Um, and then correspondingly, if you are asking students to produce media content, you have to be prepared to evaluate it. So you have to understand what it is that you think is important. If they create a website that is really ugly but has a wonderful essay in it, is that an A? Um, or is the fact that you asked it to be a website uh, somehow also ex um, anticipating that they'll need to actually create something that's graphically interesting and useful and interactive in order to take advantages of the affordances of the medium? So you really have to think about what it is you're trying to accomplish and why. But the good news is that the tools are easier and easier, and there are ways that you can insert these new media tools into your work without having it completely disrupt your already existing understanding of your pedagogy. Uh, Professor Saba, what were your own early interests in uh, computer gaming? Uh, did you have favorite computer games growing up, D&D? Um, the Sims, some, some of the uh, things that people may be more familiar of in terms of uh, virtual world creation. Hmm. Well, my original experiences, and maybe I'll date myself, um, but were with the TRS-80, which is this uh, a machine. This is back in the days of text-based games. Um, and so the first game I ever played was called Adventure, um, which is a game where you'd say things like type in go left or go right, and then you'd use paper and pencil to create a map of the spaces that you're looking into. Um, and then I also played with Atari um, and some of the adventure games, but then I really wasn't involved in the game sphere that much. Um, and growing up, I was more of the bookworm who decided to read all of Anthony Trollope. Um, and I came back to it a little bit later when graphical user interfaces became more commonplace. And I started working in the library in graduate school, creating um, online archives uh, of uh, Arthurian content for the, uh, uh, the graduate English library. Uh, so then, then after that, I started to play more with this game called Castles, which was a, a game that you did a lot of resource allocation, and then I got into The Sims and kind of got back in that way. Well, it's interesting. You talk about, um, uh, about Victorian authors. You also study and, uh, and teach Victorian literature. Uh, what, what connections uh, do you find now uh, between that uh, Victorian universe and the sort of futuristic, immersive environments of, of, uh, of what we think of as virtual worlds? Well, I think a lot of Victorian novelists in particular were very interested in creating a whole world. So people like Trollope or Eliot or Dickens, you know, those fat three-decker novels, um, they were not just focusing on, um, foc on one character's internalized experiences of a world, but they really wanted to describe the world in all its complexity and detail. And they brought in philosophical and social and economic issues of the day. So it was really a thick description, a really complex environment that they were trying to create. And so I think we do see some parallels now with what's happening even in game spaces um, when they have a whole lot of architected uh, elements and a lot of different types of interactions, a lot of different types of characters, um, where you have not just an omniscient point of view or first person point of view, but a sort of multi-niscient point of view where you can hear the story or see the story from different perspectives. So I think structurally there's more connections there than we might be aware of uh, when I'm first thinking about it. But then also the Victorian era is the era that gave us the early versions of uh, some science fiction. 
and uh, sensation fiction I've already mentioned, but also adventure fiction. The idea of traveling to another place through reading is something that you're also doing in these virtual world spaces. Uh, let me also um, remind everyone that our conversation with uh, Professor Victoria Sabo will continue. Uh, if there's uh, something you've heard today on Office Hours that would prompt you to um, send her um, a question or a comment about today's discussion, you can go to the uh, Duke University Facebook page. You can also uh, tweet us at Duke Live, and you can uh, send an email to live at duke.edu. Um, I wanted to mention before we wrap up, we have a couple more questions we'll try to squeeze in. If you, uh, it, We're very grateful for uh, everyone staying with us and for this, uh, this time today on Office Hours. Um, can you discuss just briefly um, how the idea of identity is changing because of the um, creation and uh, popularity of these virtual worlds today? Well, identity is something that has always been performative. Um, I and many theorists would argue, um, but it becomes more visible that it's performative when you're in a virtual space where you're consciously creating a representation of yourself. And I think it's important to think about not only these uh, avatar creation versions of yourself, but also identity as it gets expressed in any kind of online identity you have out in the world. Um, you can have many different faces which reminds me of Facebook, um, an area where you still have it located in your individual unitary identity. And the problem you have there is the ac exact opposite problem um, that you uh, would experience in other contexts in that you have one identity and many different audiences who are participating in that identity. I know for myself using Facebook, I have people in there who are from my family, from my undergraduate, my graduate, my previous jobs, just friends that I've made, my rowing team. Um, and each of them, in the normal run of events, I would have an identity that I would use or pull out when I'm interacting with them, consciously or unconsciously. But when you're in a place like Facebook, it flattens them out. In contrast, you might play a role within a game, an immersive game like World of Warcraft, which I've played, where you your identity is sort of reduced to the set of characteristics that uh, relate to your character working in the world. So it's not a simple thing. Um, and, and I think identity politics in virtual spaces is, is equally interesting because there's a question of what are you actually representing if you're representing a virtual version of yourself and how do you understand the relationships with others who are also creating these virtual versions of themselves that may or may not correspond with reality. Our guest today on Duke's Office Hours has been uh, Professor Victoria Sabo, we've been talking about uh, virtual worlds, the um, new media, and how these new technologies are impacting, um, impacting academics in particular, and also just the broader cultural effect of, uh, of these new technologies. Thank you so much, Dr. Sabo, for being with us today. I hope you'll also pass along our appreciation to WIDA for her participation in today's program. A reminder that uh, you can continue this discussion. Uh, the conversation can continue at Facebook, the Duke University Facebook page, on uh, Twitter at Duke Live, and via email at live at duke.edu. We also wanted to let you know of several exciting events scheduled next week here on the Duke University Ustream channel. Next uh, Wednesday, we will have a lecture on profitability solutions for climate, oil, and proliferation. On Thursday of next week, a Duke Reads conversation that'll be uh, rescheduled of an earlier event with Duke Provost Peter Lang, who will be talking about William Cohen's book, The House of Cards, which is a fascinating look at the recent uh, financial turmoil uh, in the U.S., and then next Friday, our regularly scheduled office hours session will return. We'll be talking about modern art with Nasher Museum director Kim Rorschach. Thank you again for joining us today. We hope you've enjoyed today's edition of Duke University Office Hours. Thanks again, and um, we hope to see you next time.